Hello and welcome to the Divine Renovation Podcast, where we seek to inspire and equip you to bring your parish from maintenance to mission. My name is Dan O'Rourke, and with me is Father James Mallon. It's good to see you, hey, Father. Hey, Dan. It's great to be back. And also, Ron Huntley. Good to see you, brother. You too, pal. And for those who are listening, you might not recognize just how clean-shaven Ron's face is right now. <laughs> feeling sleek. Sleek. You could probably, like, you're, 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 you're doing like the 100-mile dash in like a quarter of the time now, aren't that's, you? That's just it. <laughs> <laughs> Wind resistant. Yeah. Uh, well, it's so good to be with both of you guys. It's been a little while since we've been able to get together because a po- couple of us have been on the road. Mm. Uh, Ron, you've been here holding down the fort. <laughs> so uh, why don't you tell us, Ron, what you've been up to the last uh, little while? Well, I had an opportunity to participate. I'm a connect group leader at St. Benedict Parish yep. uh, on a team of four. Yep. So one of four. And so they, connect groups, medium-sized groups, 30-odd people meet every other week. That's true. Yep. Thank you. And uh, there was connect group leaders training this week at St. Benedict Parish. And uh, because of my travels, I haven't been able to make it recently. And so it was so much fun to be back. Uh, and there's so many changes. Like St. Benedict Parish continues to innovate. The leaders there continue to innovate. And one of the latest innovations uh, is that they've created an entire team to support the Connect Group leaders. Oh. And so, you know, we'd bought a, a stage at St. Benedict quite some time ago as for Alpha. Well, they had it all decorated. They had a cool chair there I saw and a, a picture lamp. Of that. It was so it looked fun. like a living room I on did, the stage. I know. It was so <laughs> it was fun. So cool. Like so all these little details they're paying attention to all these little details. You know, Father Alex gave a talk on on praise and worship and kind of helping people to and the whole idea of the talk was He was delivering it, in other words, modeling it. They were also providing the support notes for it, and they videotaped it. So now they have a a website page, as part a secret website page, that they post the videos for the Connect Group leaders, and they give them the notes so that they themselves can take those notes and give those talks in their Connect Groups. And they gave out the handouts in real time that night. Man, when I was in charge of connect groups, I, uh, there's no way that was ever happening. I am not that organized or thoughtful. And it's just so fun to see a whole team of people come together with all these different skill sets and gifts and just ramp up the support of connect group leaders. Like those guys are rock stars. That's I was so amazing. excited. I love yeah. that. It's fantastic. <laughs> well, that's very cool. Now, Father James, you were, uh, you've been away. And, and you and I actually ran into each other. <laughs> <laughs> Last night, uh, I, was, I was sitting there look, looking at my phone and someone grabs my shoulder and I look up at his dad on, on, on the plane, you know, as, 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 as it was boarding. Yeah, yeah, Montreal, I couldn't yeah. believe it. I saw you, I got on the plane, there you were. I'm like, oh my gosh, I was absolutely floored. But yeah, so you've been away. Where have you been? Um, two weeks ago, I did a fairly quick turnaround trip uh, to Milwaukee. I was spe- I gave the opening keynote address at the amazing parish conference there to about 1,200 leaders. Mm. And it was great to be there. It was great to connect with the amazing parish uh, f- folks and and, um, and and meet some of the people in that area. Most of the attendees were from the Archdiocese of, of Milwaukee and in neighboring dioceses. But there were folks who had traveled. Uh, we saw uh, a few of our... There was one DRN parish there, oh, yeah? or one, one former D- DRN parish there. So it was great to oh, see yeah. those guys. Father again. Dan Andrews, right? Father, Father, yeah, good. Father Dan. It was great to see him, <laughs> him and his team. Uh, so that that was a, that was a really great trip. And then just last night when we saw each other, <laughs> we I was on my way other, home yeah. from uh, doing uh, two days in the diocese of Auckland. Because what were you doing in, in Auckland? So we did um, initially when the conversation um, about going out there began about two years ago. You know, we, at that point, we had changed to, to, we were starting to say no to requests just to speak to priests. Because really, when if we're talking about, you know, the heart of getting all this going is a different model of leadership, and it has to be collaborative, and you've got, it's, you've got to share your, your, share your leadership. Well, we realize, you know, the, the, the medium is the message. Mm, yes. and, and, if, and we say more by well, how we do things than by what we say. And so... Amen. It doesn't make any sense. So, so to just speak to priests about about this. So um, the condition was you've got to you've got to be priests and lay leaders. So we had uh, for the first day a hundred and fifty priests and about three hundred lay leaders. Right, it's awesome. In this big huge space, and <laughs> it was really great. When I got there on Monday night, I, I wasn't quite sure what to expect. There, there was a I don't know if it was just me, but there was a sense of. Um, yeah, I just, I felt, I'm, I'm not sure how this is going to go. And yeah. so we called in some extra prayer support. We got the, the sisters in England praying for us. We've got a, <laughs> a, a, a community of cloistered nuns who, who, who partner with us to intercede. So we called in the big guns. And the next day- You put day, it on Twitter too. And so that yeah, just, uh, you know, your the whole next Twitter. day, I have to say, it was amazing. Mm. It was amazing. There was a, 
sense of freedom just to you know to speak into things and each segment of the of the day we stopped and we prayed called on the holy spirit and a, and a I think for them, maybe in a bit of a bold way, but sure. there were there were there were breakthroughs, there were tears, like hearts were moved, and That's awesome. and uh, yeah, and I think the at the end of Tuesday nights, I also did a, a, a full morning with the priests and and the bishop the next day. But the end of Tuesday night, we had supper with the priests, and I met this older priest, and he said, "You know, I wasn't I wasn't going to come to this. I had thought this was a load of rubbish." I was. <laughs> and he said. This was really good. I'm so glad I came. So praise God. That's, uh, why? Why did yeah. he feel that way? Did he say like what was the? I think I that for experienced. oftentimes gatherings, it's like, well, it's just going to be another, yeah, someone coming to yeah. tell us that we're no good and we we should be doing what they're doing, or you know, someone from dinner, you know, how, yeah. some, some guy from far away with another program, and what's this going to do? And mm. um, I, I think that that was it. You know, yeah, I would, th- I, I, yeah. I think, yeah. no fair. And isn't it wonderful? Uh, it's always one of my. It's, those are the funnest stories to tell when, when there's resistance. Cause yeah, we go to, you know, even people in the corporate world, you have to go to corporate events and you know, if you've been to a few of them, you've been to all of them. <laughs> and so after a while you can get jaded. And isn't it wonderful when, when we can be surprised mm. and, and uh, when we can change our perspective and even more the courage it would have taken him to come up and tell you that. Like, I love yeah, that. That's true. Like I really yeah. love that. And I think what I'm always reminded about, reminded of when I have the, the chance to speak to groups like this is, we're so blessed in the church, in spite of all of the challenges and the struggles that we have. There are amazing people, like amazing people, True. just amazing people, <laughs> amazing priests, amazing bishops, amazing lay, lay leaders all yeah. over the place. We just got to get our act together. <laughs> you know, it's, it's true. So. Well, in fact, you know, to that point, Father James, like I'll, I remember uh, Diane Sutherland from our church, uh, you know, after we started getting the Alpha culture going at St. Benedict Parish, she said, I remember her witnessing one time saying, I've been a Catholic my entire life. This is the first time I felt like I belonged to a community. Mm-hmm. Right? Like if we just rely on the formula <laughs> yeah. and, and we don't intentionally create spaces where people can get to know each other and chill out and, mm. and, and be real, uh, it changes everything. How about you, Dan? You've been away too. Where were you coming back from? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we're, uh, Father James and I met in Montreal, although neither of us were actually in Montreal. It just seemed to be the passing through point that, that we found ourselves. And I was in Calgary uh, with Church Planting Canada. Okay. Uh, and so Graham, Graham Singh, who we'd had on uh, the podcast a, a week ago, I think. Um, so he was, he's the executive director there and he'd invited me out. And I was the, the, it, the, the organization's actually been around for a long time. I didn't have a full appreciation of it, but it's been around for a long time. And I was the first Catholic to ever attend. And for them, this was a huge deal. Mm. Um, I just went with sort of this spirit of, I want to go and learn and see what these guys are up to. And man, did I learn. Uh, so there's about 75 leaders, denominational leaders from across Canada there. And, uh, you know, I got lots of big takeaways, but I guess one of them, the one that shocked me most was just how many of these, these denominations are, are doubling down on coaching. They're doubling down on coaching churches because they're seeing that it's having fruit. So the same kind of work that we do, uh, they're approaching. Now, everyone's got their own sort of variation and like, sure. and, and it was really neat to start to begin to understand and peel back some of the layers of the way these guys are approaching it. Uh, but it, it was just, it's fascinating to see how many are, are seeing coaching as being a solution to the challenge that that uh, we're facing as churches. And the other thing I really enjoyed and this, uh, you know, because Graham had said it a few times, I think he might have even said it on the podcast. He's like, Dan, yeah. You, you, you're thinking about what church planting is, but you're thinking about it wrong. Okay. And I thought, okay, well, I, like, yeah, because what is church planting? Well, so this, for starters, what is church planting, right? Yeah. And so, so there's the thing that usually you know we have that comes to mind, at least for me, is you know when when you know you try and you take a community or or you take a pastor and you put them into a place and, and a, a brand new place. Often you rent like here in Halifax, I've seen it happen in movie theaters and schools, yeah. and you try and start a church, right? And so that's that's sort of the church planting that, that evokes in my mind. mind. Yeah. And, and what you know, Graham had been trying to help me understand is a lot of the work that we do here at Divine Renovation, as we, as we help parishes kind of turn around, mm. as, we, as, we, we, as we take what was existing but kind of reboot it, that that kind of fits into the definition of church planting in their world. They, they often use the word replant. Now, their nomenclature is different, obviously, uh, but you know, that's often, when I spoke to so many of these leaders, these denominational leaders, it's exactly what they're focused on. But it seems a bit odd. I mean, you talk about planting. If you replant, you take a plant out of a one pot and stick it in another pot. Well, look, you, you, right. we, can, we can fight over the language, but it, it doesn't matter in my sense. What, what they're doing, though, is they're, they're focusing on the churches they've got that are either in maintenance 
And uh, uh, this was a gesture uh, for those who were listening. It's this sort of flat line. <laughs> I saw this so much. Like, yeah, as, as opposed to, <laughs> as yeah. opposed to thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, so the, the, a lot of the evangelicals there were flatlined would be the way they, you know, so they've plateaued. And, and so what they're doing is they're focusing their energy, their coaching, their, their, their resources, their mentorship networks, their coaching, they're, they're focusing those on the, on the churches they have that have hit that plateau uh, and and so it's anyways it was really interesting to to learn from these guys. I think that this concept of of planting is is important for us because uh, remember about a year and a half ago, two years ago, I met with Bishop Rick Thorpe. He's a bishop in the Anglican Church. He's he comes out of the world of Holy Trinity Brompton, and he oversees uh, for, for for them their, their their church plants. And literally right now, I believe HTB Holy Trinity Brompton, the church that that, that birthed Alpha is almost every second month they are sending out an ordained person and 20 to 30 parishioners with a check of 50,000 pounds to move into a dying church. And when I say dying churches, these churches you maybe really have like, mean dying. like 12 people in the whole church. Right. Like, so it's pretty dead. Yeah. And they go in and, and they begin to build something new. And uh, I remember meeting with them because I had a sense that you know, as things continue to, to decline in the West, uh, for, for, for us, the more things fall apart, the more opportunities that the there are going to be. The more people are open to, to trying do new ideas. really yeah. cool, wonderful things. So one says, I, I can't wait. Like, I, I'm really <laughs> excited for when it totally falls apart because a lot of places are running around trying to keep everything up and, and it's like tying it together with bits of strings and propping up. And the, mm. and the, and the, the mission, the real sense of purpose of, of many dioceses is... is Keep it all open. Keep it all going. Try to keep it going. We're bringing people in, and and it's it's not the the clock's ticking on it, yeah. and it's gonna it's gonna fall, uh, and then it's gonna be okay. Now that we've stopped trying to make keeping the infrastructure running the primary focus, now we can make mission the primary focus. And how do we then take what we have and build an infrastructure that actually serves the mission? And then you get really cool opportunities mm-hmm. and. Yeah. And one of the problems is is I, I think that we're not the structure of of maintenance Christendom model parish life is dying, but it's not dead enough yet. Right. I wish it would just hurry up and die, yeah. and then we can really see something new. And we're we're actually seeing in a in our network um, a couple of instances where it's not so much trying to renovate a parish. You know, mm-hmm. the word renovate means to make new that's again. What we do. Yeah. As it is really at the diocesan level, because some dioceses. I always have trouble with that word. I said that last <laughs> time. Some dioceses are actually intentionally starting a new parish mm-hmm. uh, that has a kind of a missionary DNA from the beginning, from the very start. They're intentionally missionary. So that's, that's a, it's not exactly a turnaround. It's kind of a new startup, but it's a part of turning around a diocese. And, and so I think this world, we have a lot to learn because mm-hmm. so many other Christian communities have been doing this for for, for 10 years or more. Yeah. And yeah. there's, there's lots to learn. I, I was really, I was heartened by uh, the willingness of, of all the people in, in, in Calgary that, that were at that event, that their willingness to share their successes, but also their willingness to share their failures. Cause I, I mean, we can learn so much from what people have tried that haven't worked. And, and mm. uh, can I share a really quick story? It was, um, I, it was an experience, a neat experience for me. Uh, I, I, they asked me to share on night one. So I got up and I shared sort of, the, you know, what we do, what's divine renovation, what's our vision for the future. And, and, uh, you know, what, what, what do we hope parishes will be? And we talked about how, you know, we want to be missional. And I talked about things like the Pentecost challenge and, and, you know, and, and our, our sort of our focus on, on, you know, the, the three key characteristics. And, and also I talked about all those things and anyways, afterwards, you know, a lot of people are coming up to me and, and, and wanting to, to thank me for the talk. And, uh, one of these guys came up to me, he was uh, one of the leaders from the Pentecostal assemblies of Canada. And uh, he, he was, he's saying like, Dan, I was just so blown away by, by what you shared. And, and the Pentecost challenge, some of our, our guys, our guys wouldn't have the courage to get up there and, and do that. He said, after listening to your talk, I, I feel like the Pentecostal church has to become more Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, hilarious. Just, it, was, anyways, it was just so cool to have that. We had so many words of affirmation for, for what we're up to and words of encouragement. Well, when we focus on mission, you will find unity. That's it. When you focus on mission, you will find unity in the church. I remember being at HTB for one of their conferences when I heard the words, they used the word church plan. 
And my understanding of church plant was what you alluded to earlier, Dan. You know, this evangelical, either somebody breaks off because they don't like the church they're involved with and they mm-hmm. go start another church, or they get the support of their denomination to go start another church in an area that already has 100 churches. Yeah. And uh, and so when they said it, I, I went up to them afterwards and said, wait a minute, what are you talking about? You guys are Anglican. You guys have parishes. You guys have bishops. You guys are under authority. What are you talking about? You can't do that. Like, what do you mean? Because it just seems so foreign. He, those two things, they didn't seem to, to collide. He said, no, 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 no. And, and then he talked about how they do it. No, it's with, it's with the permission of that community. It's at their request. It's at their request with the permission of the bishop. And so it is in unity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so they, their whole denomination in that area has a vision for that. It's like, oh, okay, I see. I get it. And it actually really excited me because our hope is... And, you know, even at St. Benedict, you know, people are taking on, like, they're helping other churches all over the city uh, with Alpha. Actually, even other denominations. We have people from St. Benedict going and helping other denominations launch their Alphas and to be successful. And so I think we're going to get there at some point when there's, when mm-hmm. people are ready. All right. So on that note, I'd love for us to take a quick pause because I'm so excited to bring on Patrick Sala, who's going to be joining us to tell a little bit, a little bit about his experience of, of, of sort of his journey to becoming a seminary and the experience he's having now. So we'll be right back. <laughs> Hello and welcome back. And I'm so happy to bring Patrick Sala. Thank you for joining us, Patrick. You're welcome. So, so Father James, I, I think instead of me introducing Patrick, it might make more sense for you to introduce Patrick because I know how excited you are that he's here. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm very, very excited. Uh, Patrick, I first met, I think pretty much on my very first day when I pulled up at St. Benedict Parish. And Patrick, you were helping out with music at the time. You played the organ and you were, you were, you were taking lead in, in music and you were what, eight years old. And I'm looking, <laughs> no, you're, you're, this is a remarkable 18. guy. I was thinking, I was 18. Yeah. But I had no idea. Like I thought you were like, you know, 22, 23 or something. And I found out you were still in high school and, and he was, amazing. I thought, man, this guy is amazing. You know, I don't want to, but, but anyway, you, you helped me unload my car and, <laughs> and Patrick, you, you were you, eventually one of the first things I did was I increased your hours and your salary. And we, we had a lot of fun together in those early yeah. years and you were on staff and you witnessed a lot of the early goof ups and all the mistakes <laughs> and, and the painful growth and the change that happened all the way up until when did you, was it when you, when you, when you went into the seminary that yes. you, that you actually stepped out of being on staff? Yes. Yeah, yeah. It would have been the spring of 2015. I graduated from my undergrad. I concluded my ministry at St. Benedict and I went off to the seminary. That's right. Uh, so yeah. Cool. yeah. <laughs> so why don't you tell us a little bit about how you discerned that you even wanted to go into seminary? What was that process like for you? For sure. So as we were saying, like I grew up in in a parish that eventually would amalgamate and become St. Benedict Parish. And uh, it, it happened for me, I think, during my formative years. You know, I was a teenager and that's usually a time when people are starting to, they're either growing in their faith or they're starting to stray from their faith. Good point. And uh, for me, it was a time when we were engaged in this, this process of amalgamation, this process of kind of changing what had been the status quo and being... A uh, parishioner at that time was was a, a value, but also being involved in ministry at that time. And so uh, with my role in music, when you're involved in ministry, you get more than just your average parishioner in That's terms true. of formation and in terms of, you know, getting on board with the vision and the message. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I remember it was a time when even as a family, you'd come home from mass and you were really talking about the homily and it was getting you engaged. And uh, uh, from there, I... When I went to university, I got in, in uh, connection with CCO, uh, Catholic Christian Outreach, and seeing other young people taking their faith really seriously and it making a difference in their lives, you know, Monday to Friday, not just on the weekend. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that had an impact on me and it uh, really challenged me to grow in my faith. And then as I'm growing in my faith and the, the call to holiness, it uh, put me in a position to really discern what is God's call for my life as I was going through my undergrad. and. Um, in time that uh, led me to discern a priestly vocation and to apply to the seminary. It's interesting because it's so helpful when, like a couple of things I'm hearing. One, the support of your family, right? Two, engaged in ministry. And three, um, 
taking what you're what you're experiencing on Sunday's home to be in a vibrant community, to be well led. Father Bernie O'Neill was the pastor before Father James, and I'm sure he played a role in your life for sure. You know, encouraging you because it's my hope that many, many more uh, seminarians would come out of St. Benedict Parish and parishes around the world in the DRN because when your church is on fire and alive and we're recognizing the gifts and talents and people and calling them into ministry, it really helps them discern what God's saying in their life. And yeah. It's so exciting to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> Help me understand what it was like. So as a guy who was discerning the priesthood, you were you were in or discerning seminary, you, you, you were in St. Benedict Parish, right? So that's a mission-focused church, which, you know, isn't necessarily uh, the norm in the Catholic world. You know, as we move, we, we're, we're, our hope is that it becomes the, the standard. But, you know, right now, I don't know that it necessarily is. But did that did that culture shape you at all in terms of your discernment? Definitely. Uh, and one of the things I'll say, too, is sometimes you don't realize what it's like in the other parishes. You only really know your yeah, experience. Yeah. And uh, there were times when when I wasn't in St. Benedict, if I was traveling or something, you go to another parish, uh, be it in the, in the archdiocese or in another part of the world, and it was moments then that you sort of realized what you had at St. Benedict. <laughs> yeah. Just from your Sunday experience and the yeah. preaching and the, you know, uh, the worship experience, you realized what you had more when you were away from it. But being part of a parish where you saw lives being transformed, mm -hmm. that definitely has impacted my view of the priesthood. I don't want to be a priest just to kind of keep the lights running. I want to bring a, be a priest <laughs> to, to change lives and to bring people to Christ. Oh. Uh, and when you're seeing that happen and you see that it's actually possible, it's not just some <laughs> lofty idea, uh, like it touches your heart and it touches people's hearts. And I think it touches everyone in the parish's heart. And it, it, it begs the question, how can I be a part of this? Mm. And for me, it was, uh, I've discerned that to be a vocation to the priesthood. That is so cool. I, I remember <laughs> um, years ago when I, I was going to be having a meeting with you, Patrick, and I asked you to, at our next meeting, let's talk about the goals for the coming year, because you, you were overseeing music, and we had uh, we had sent you to London to uh, yes. a, a music conference so we could begin to grow contemporary music, and you've, be, you've been trained in, in a more tr traditional style, and, and you have a love for that, but we're very open to helping us grow in this other area. So we had different, mu the musical styles were beginning to grow, but uh, I asked you to, you know, kind of present with me the goals for the coming year. I'll never forget. I think you were, you were only like 19 at the time. It gives it to my office, puts a laptop in front of me and, and presents a, a PowerPoint demonstration yeah, <laughs> for, for, the, for the coming year, which was absolutely, it was absolutely great. So I, I, right away, you know, that, that, that sense of the importance of leadership as well. And the other thing I appreciated about you was, I think you and your members of your family, you ran Alpha in a community center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you did a, a Alpha, you participated in one of the big ones, but then went outside and, yes. and ran it as well. That was great. <laughs> so great. Like, can you imagine if every priest, part of the formation was to evangelize and run an Alpha and see lives change? Like, yeah. man, that would really equip them for, you know, ministry and mission uh, as, a, as a theologian and as a leader in our church. Yeah. So you've been off to seminary for a little while. Help us understand what it looks like. What's the formation process? And where, where, where do you see a lot of richness? And are there areas where we think maybe there's opportunity for, for growth? Absolutely. So I'm very blessed to attend St. Augustine's Seminary in the Archdiocese of Toronto. Mm -hmm. And, uh, is that your seminary? That was my seminary, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's what I love about it is it it's it brings together guys from uh, such a diverse uh, kind of pool of dioceses in the country, and uh, everyone's experience is a little bit different pastorally in their area, and uh, there's different ways of doing things. So we're able to to see what others are doing, see what their challenges are, um, and to learn from each other. And so it's really an exciting opportunity to be there. Um, a big part of, of seminary formation, of course, is academic formation. And uh, so I've done a, a year of philosophy studies and now two years of theology studies. So I've been there three years. And, and this year I'm on my parish internship here in the Archdiocese of Halifax, Yarmouth at St. Thomas More Parish. Um, so, but the, for, the formation of the seminary is going through a bit of a transition as well, because um, at one time, and probably this might have been the case when Father James was there, was it was very, was very, very <laughs> academically centered, and the rector of the seminary was uh, was an academic, and there there was a lot of emphasis on the academics, and there still is because it is so important that we have good academic formation. But they've actually changed the leadership structure at the seminary, so instead of having a rector who is the the president and the uh, rector sort of thing. It's separate now. And uh, the rector is really a pastor. 
So our uh, rector of the seminary is uh, one of the great pastors of the archdiocese. And really the whole feel at the seminary is now more of a parish, whereas our, our rector is our parish priest, and uh, he's forming us to be pastoral priests, uh, focused on ministry in a parish, not as uh, academics, though we need the academic formation. And so we're seeing a transition happening uh, in the way that that formation is carried out and in the kinds of things that we're exposed to outside of um, the formation program. Um, just a few years ago, my first year, I'd only been there about three months, and uh, one of our guest speakers was none other than Father James Mallon. Jeez, and, anybody uh, in that, that seminary. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them even twice. <laughs> and, uh, it was great because every, every seminarian was given a copy of the book, uh, Divine Renovation. We were encouraged to read it, and we got to hear firsthand from Father James. And, uh, uh, you know, I, in the document on priestly formation, Pastoris Dabovobis, it talks about the different people involved in formation. And mm. there's the primary person is the bishop, there's the seminary, there's the professors, but uh, the, really the key person is the seminarian himself. What is each person open to? What are they seeking out? And uh, how are they um, allowing themselves to be formed? And I think for me, because of my experience at St. Benedict, it's, it's setting me up to be open to these different things and to be seeking out how are ways that we can become a missionary uh, church and have missionary parishes, but also recognizing that when we gather as a seminary representing many dioceses, there's so many different realities. And so what, what extra aspects of formation do we need to provide in our own diocese mm. for guys coming back to serve in our local church? Mm. Yeah. Uh, and that goes, I think, ultimately to the bishop and his team uh, to fill in those gaps for our, our local context. It, it's a huge question right now. In the, the last couple of months as I've been traveling around, one, one recurring question has been, what does this shift from, from, from maintenance, a maintenance church born out of a Christendom experience to, to, to mission, how does that impact seminary formation? I was asked that question. We had a great discussion about it in New Zealand. Uh, I discussed with seminary rectors this question in Manila, in South Africa, in the UK, in the UK, in the UK, and the US, and and there needs to be a new conversation around mm -hmm. this because it's not just about the shift from academic to to pastoral. Is well, what what model of pastoral reality mm -hmm. are we shaping guys for? Because traditionally we we form guys to be um, philosopher, theologian, monk chaplains. You know, where the the model of pastoral care where the priest is is on call to be. Um, you know, 24-7 uh, to be everyone's personal counselor. And again, there's, there's very little uh, inf uh, focus on leadership. It, and the overwhelming pastoral model of pastoral care is, is, is therapeutic care, you know, not mm -hmm. necessarily leading people to maturity and mobilizing the people of God. So I think that's a, that's a big question we need mm -hmm. to look at. And I, I, I'd love in, in the future to, to, to see... Uh, some a lot of people come together to discuss this question because we're now in a another apostolic age and and our a core model of priestly formation right now at least as far as I can see is still from the Counter Reformation we're still in that mode. So. What about this is something I think about often too and um, even as you were talking about the shift, Patrick. One of the two, couple of things I heard is is that you know we're it's more pastoral. Yes, we still need the, it's one and the other. It's pastoral and academic. It's really important. I couldn't agree more um, to prepare us for ministry. And that seems to be the focus of seminaries to prepare people for pastoral ministry. And I think that might even be appropriate in that I, I, I don't know that there's not another area for another injection of education. And that's when a priest becomes a pastor. Almost as if, hey, we're going to make you a path. You know, so form the seminarians the best way we can and with the best information. But what would it look like if a bishop said, you know what? Those three priests are going to become pastors in the next year. And then they go back to experience what it means to become a leader. Because learning how to be a leader in a seminary, when you get out and you're not going to be a leader, you actually have to work with the leader I don't know if that makes as much sense. And so to me, I'm not so sure we don't need another uh, uh, go back to reformation. See, so if we, that conversation ever happens, you're going to have to be in on it because that's, <laughs> that's a really good point. That's a really good point because I remember when I was first ordained, you know, and, and, and if, you, if you've got that zeal and you've got a, a sense of vision and you're with someone who's not a leader, it, it almost it kills, kills you. you. It yeah. kills. I almost didn't make it. Right. You know, and it's, and it's yeah. 
So that's a, that's a very good point. We have some friends in the UK. They're doing some work and they were going to the seminary for the second time. And I, they said, what should I tell them? I said, I wouldn't talk a lot about DR. Prepare them for what they're going to be experiencing in the in the in the churches they're going to, because if you talk too much about DR, you're going to frustrate the daylights out of them, to be honest with you. And that would be my fear, is to get yeah, but, them all jacked up. But at the then, same time, how do you, I mean, there's, there's a great conversation. Yes. Right? Is it, like, <laughs> the, 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 that is true, but how do you create that yearning? Um, and how, how do you give them a sense of vision right. of what is possible yeah. so they can dream? I right. mean, every, everyone in any, any, any role in life, you've got to, you know, you, you don't get to, they don't give you the car keys right away, you know. Right. Like, you, you, yeah. but, but it doesn't yeah. mean you 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 can't dream about driving, heading down the highway, you know. <laughs> True so. enough, love it. So you're over at uh, St. Thomas More, More right Parish, now. Yeah. So so that's an internship. It's a and St. Thomas More is one of the parishes in the Divine Renovation Network. Yes. Uh, so help me understand what it's like to be over there. What's it like to be interning yeah. at a Divine you're just, Renovation the, the, Parish? St. Thomas More Parish is, is at the beginning uh, mm-hmm. of that journey. So tell us a little, yeah, uh, about what's going on there. Yeah, so it's really exciting to be to be there at this time. As Father James said, they're, they're at the beginning of changing the culture of the parish and uh, striving to become missionary. Uh, they have a senior leadership team, which I I'm, get to sit in on this year while I'm there. Uh, and it's so great to see how that works. But I think the what I'm noticing and finding very refreshing is this sense of openness from the ministry leads, from a lot of the parishioners, from the leadership team um, who recognize that we have to do something differently. Mm. And and they want to bring people back to the church. They want to bring people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, and so it's shifting everything. And so it's, it's causing us to rethink every single ministry right down to the core of their identity, what they do, how they lead, uh, and and when when that happens, there's actually more work than you know what to do with. That's, that's <laughs> that's so, and, uh, so I was in a meeting. I was in a meeting the other week, and we we sort of identified all this work that needed to be done, and uh, there was this sense of being overwhelmed. And mm-hmm. and I was just like, well, we just have to make a list, make our priority, and uh, do one at a time, because that's all we can do. <laughs> and if you do if you do work with this ministry really well, and you get their leadership of that ministry. Uh, strengthened, then you don't need to invest in them as much. They're able to kind of mm-hmm. look after themselves mm-hmm. and we move on to the next one. Um, and so uh, I think one of the experiences I bring with me from being at St. Benedict was there can be so much zeal to do it quickly uh, that it's not always realistic. Um, and so we have to have patience in this too. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, and, and I, I have said more than once when we're talking about things we want to accomplish, I say, well, I'm only here for the year. It's going to take longer than this to accomplish all of right. these things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it really takes time, and it took time at St. Benedict, and it's going to take time in any parish to, to, to slowly move in that direction and, and to have it trickle down to all the ministries. You know, you start up at the leadership, um, but then you actually have to bring it down in a concrete way to each ministry in such a way that they're able to own it. Uh, lead it and sustain it, basically. Well, we, we like to. You I know. know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a couple a couple of years ago, we began intentionally, intentionally trying to change our language. Rather, we talk about trickling down as opposed to bubbling up, because yes. the leadership is the is is the base who supports rather than Sorry. being mm. being being from the top down. But we're we're still <laughs> we're trying to be. We're, we're we're trying to, hope, uh, to 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 check each other on the on that. Uh, Patrick, you talked about you know. When you begin to lead, leadership is work. And in many of our parishes, leadership is not necessarily happening. There might be management or administration, and there might be a lot of busyness, but leadership is a lot of work. And so one of the questions that we often uh, have to grapple with, with with the parishes and the network is, okay, so what are you going to stop doing? Mm -hmm. Because if you just take on this extra work on top of everything you're already doing, uh, you might not make it to the end. So is, have you dealt with that dynamic there? Well, ab- have you seen it in absolutely. play? Absolutely. I mean, just <laughs> from my own experience there, you know, you can go to the leadership meeting and have all these great discussions, but with those great discussions, you just come action items. And Amen. so you leave that meeting and you've got work to do. And there's a balance that one has to strive for and achieve between the time I spend talking about the things I'm going to do <laughs> and the time I spend doing the things I say I'm going to do. And so when your schedule gets loaded up with yes. um, liturgies and pastoral care and meetings uh, and diocesan events you have to attend, 
And then suddenly you look at your schedule and like, there's no time left to actually sit down and just do the work. Like it's time at my desk or time working with a, with right. a, a leader or something, um, or preparing a homily or preparing a talk. Uh, these things take time. And so trying to balance all the different commitments and demands and yeah, in that, in that model, you have to prioritize what is the most important and what are the things that you need to be giving your time to and how much time is reasonable to spend in each area kind of thing. Do you know what? You'd, honestly, I hear you talk, Patrick, you'd make a perfect coach in the now. And I say that quite <laughs> seriously because that's what so many of the churches struggle with is they look at St. Benedict, they see all the things going on and they want to launch everything and want everything to be quick. People get overwhelmed and stressed. They realize they don't have enough staff. They can't get enough things done. You have just such a wonderful wisdom about you to recognize. Like, I love that clarity list prioritize and set realistic expectations. And sometimes it's so hard to do when you change gears and you see how much work there is. Mm. It can be overwhelming, but I love your approach. And I'd like to say I was always like this. I wasn't. <laughs> and, uh, I can remember when I was on staff at St. Benedict, often being totally overwhelmed and run ragged and feeling like this, this such a sense of urgency, which is a good thing to feel urgent that this is important and we must, we must act, but so urgent that it was like you don't have time to eat, sleep, or breathe, and it's not healthy, and it's, it's, yeah. uh, it's overkill. And so you want to strive for all those good things, but we have to we have to take care of ourselves too in the and, process. And, and you were in on the ground at St. Benedict through our crazy years. You know, the yeah. when I was running on the principle, the more the merrier, and 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 it was nuts. It was yeah. we we almost blew the place up. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, we had people ar around. I had people around me who, you know, smacked me around a little bit and yeah. helped me to see what what we were doing, it wasn't sustainable. Mm. And well, and there's sustainability the, the leadership is, team. Yeah, right. that's right. Yeah. 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 Versus leading from your own disposition and perspectives and values when you, that leadership team changed everything, didn't it? It mm. changed my life. Yeah. And it was fun to be a part of it. But well, it's I even remember from my own perspective in the, in the area of music, there was often more demands coming at me than I could handle, mm -hmm. uh, than the ministry could handle. Um, and the hard thing was they were such good demands. Mm. Yeah. There were things that you knew we needed <clears throat> and you wanted them, and it would be great if we had them three weeks ago. Uh, and, and so there was this urgency, like this is what we need for music today, and yet we didn't have the capacity to provide it right now. And uh, you know that can be a real challenge when you're leading an area of the, of the parish, and it's, it's not in a place to provide what we, what we sense we need at present. And uh, so that can be hard to reconcile with. It was really fun watching you, Patrick. I think your, your experience and your wisdom was well beyond your age. But, you know, you talk about capacity and being overwhelmed and having so many hours in the day to actually do the work. But that wasn't how I necessarily only saw you operate. You were raising up leaders, even as a 19 and 20 year old. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, you know, I remember I've always been someone, I think it's one of my the gifts I've been blessed with to be able to see people's gifts and where they can fit into the big picture kind of thing. And I remember uh, Father James and I had been talking about our desire to have contemporary music in the parish, and uh, it was something we wanted to do, but we weren't exactly sure who would be able to, to lead that. And so I remember being at Mass, it was the octave of Easter, and I looked out in the congregation, I was up at the Ambo singing the psalm, and I saw Sarah McKinnon, <laughs> and I thought, she does praise and worship. And I went to her after mass and said, what are you doing here? And I found out she was, you know, maybe this was going to be her new parish. And I said, oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it started this, uh, you know, uh, uh, courting her, if you will, on behalf of the yeah, parish. Yeah. And uh, it, took, it took some time till she was in a position yeah. to be ready to, to uh, come alongside. But, uh, you know, I, re I, I had to sort of, I saw in her the capacity to do what we needed. And, uh, and actually at the beginning, I don't think she saw the capacity in herself mm. because she'd been involved in that ministry, but had never been the leader of it. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know why, but I just had this faith that she actually could do this. Uh, and we just had to convince her that she could do it. <laughs> and awesome. uh, so she came on and it took about a year and a half before the band really kind of yeah, got, got off the ground. And so every, every week I would go and sometimes I'd play and sometimes I would just be present to support them uh, as they were getting off the ground. There was different members each week kind of thing before it really kind of got concrete who was, who was in the band and uh, spent a lot of time with them Sunday mornings and outside of Sunday mornings just to 
investing, invest right? in them to the point where they felt comfortable. And actually, about uh, just over a year before I was to graduate, and, I, and sort of I knew the trajectory was that I'd be leaving the parish around that time. Uh, before we started that ministry year, leading up to it, I said to Sarah and the band, I said, you know, at this point, I still kind of come in about maybe 10 Sundays a year to play the piano and do different things and to fill in the gaps. And I said, we need to get to a place where you can handle the whole year without me because I'm not going to be here. Uh, and so I said, I will be your last resort this year, but I want you to, you need to now raise up people to fill your gaps. Um, and they did. And then suddenly I was no longer ever in the band. And uh, uh, I had a lot of fun working with them. And yeah. so, yeah, I missed that part a bit, but it was what needed to happen. I couldn't just keep filling in and then disappear one day because then there'd be a hole that all of a sudden we didn't have anyone Amazing to fill. example of a leadership mindset. Amazing. So fun. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> so Patrick, you know, our, our diocese, like many dioceses around the world, we're in a process of restructuring right now. And so I, I got to be, I got to think it's kind of a, oh, it's got to be a weird experience for you. You know, you're, you're in seminary and, and everything back here in, 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 you know, Halifax Yarmouth, our diocese is, is sort of shifting. Mm -hmm. well, help me understand. How do, how do you even, how do you even look at it? What does it look like to you, man? Yeah. I think I'm in a unique position in that I've actually lived through an amalgamation. And until you've lived through it, I think it maybe is something very scary um, and kind of mystical. You don't really know what to expect. Um, and I'm not going to say it's not scary because it was. Going through it was, was challenging and you had three communities coming together. Um, but you also saw the good that could come. Uh, out of it. And that's what, that's what St. Benedict Parish. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you see the fruit that is attainable in this process. So I think in terms of a restructuring, it's not enough. And I'll quote something Father James said on his very first Sunday at oh. St. Benedict <laughs> Parish. <laughs> he showed up in 2010 in August and it was his first weekend mass. And I remember it was the four o'clock mass and I was standing at the back of the church and he stood at the steps the, uh, in front of the altar, and he said, if we don't change our ways of doing things, if all we do is change our address and our furniture, there's nothing stopping us from 20 years from now amalgamating further mm -hmm. to accommodate a, 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 a dying church. And that was very powerful because uh, for a lot of people like in, who were already in the parish during the amalgamation process, we had experienced a lot of change. We'd experienced a lot of uh, you know, selling your possessions, taking up your cross and following, mm -hmm. following Jesus mm. uh, up this hill, if you will, <laughs> uh, to, in Clayton Park. Um, and it would have been nice if when we got there, everything was done. <laughs> <laughs> People actually said that the very first week, they were like, oh, thank goodness you're here. All the change yes. is finished. <laughs> and Father James came in and said, no, it's not. <laughs> we're just getting started. And, uh, you know, which was a challenge for people because change isn't, isn't easy. But what I'm getting at in all this is there's two ways to restructure ultimately. We can restructure in kind of a palliative care model that is managed decline, mm -hmm. and we can restructure in a way that's all about the mission. And right. one, of the, one of the fruits for me um, since I've been a seminarian is I've, on my summer's home, I've been able to, the bishop has sent me to different parts of the diocese to mm. experience different experiences there, different parish life, different uh, regional like geography and what life is like. But you're also seeing different parishes and how they're preparing for the restructuring. And what's so important is that in the, in the bishop's plans and in his letters, he's talking about mission being at the center of all of this. Yep. And, and that's great, but we actually have to make it the heart of it. And so yes. sometimes you go to, the, you'll go to a meeting uh, and for some people, mission is something they're not as familiar with. And so it's, well, we can have a mission committee in the new parish. <laughs> It's, and it. it's like it's like being a disciple. Jesus can't be something on the side of my life over yeah, here. He has right. to be at the center. Yeah, but we we, mission isn't something we do. It's, it, it's who it's, we are. Exactly. And so in Jesus community committee and so on the side. Jesus, <laughs> in the church, the mission can't be something on on our agenda. It has to be the center and has to permeate everything That's we right. do. And, and so and, uh, the opportunity in the restructuring is that we let the mission be the mission and let let that be the heart of what we're doing. Um, but that, again, talking about it as a vision is one thing, but then equipping our pastors and our parish leadership teams to actually bring that about 
um, is a different thing. And so there's a great opportunity in all of this, mm. for sure. So Patrick, I'm wondering, you were at the meeting we had two weeks ago with the priests and deacons of our archdiocese when we presented the first draft of, of, of the proposal for the, for the restructuring and the new leadership structures and all of this. I'm just wondering, like, what was it like for you? Because you, you're a couple of years away from, God willing, being, being, being ordained. And, you know, you're, you're going to live all the way through this. You're going to be living the fruits of this. Yeah. Uh, so what's going through your mind and your heart as you listen to these things? Well, I'll say the first thing I sensed for maybe the first time, or at least the most concretely at this time, uh, a real openness from the whole presbyterate and mm. from the, the deacons. Um, that I hadn't, I hadn't sensed so vastly before. Um, at this kind of acknowledgement that, okay, we do have to actually do something different. Like nobody's kind of hiding the issues anymore. Like we see where things are going, uh, and yet there's still so much, so much work to be done amongst us as a team. And I think team is the first thing. We have to. This is a this is a diocesan church, and we have to work together. And so. Our presbyterate can't be in kind of silos, each working in their own little corner of the diocese. There has to be, we have to have the same vision. We have to be working together, even in our own our own parishes. And uh, and we all have to be able to articulate the vision. And so I think for for some, some priests and deacons, because they haven't been formed in this way and they haven't heard it as much, it's going to take them some more time to, to be able to own it and actually talk about it themselves um, in a way that we want our ministry leads to talk mm-hmm. about it. Uh, so that's coming. Uh, there's more work to be done, but it's coming. For myself, a lot of it, because I grew up in St. Benedict Parish and worked on team, a lot of it is not that new for me. And I've seen the fruits of it. I see how it works. I know that it works. Um, and it's how I would want to carry out my ministry as mm-hmm. a priest. Um, just this past summer, I had the opportunity to walk the Camino de Santiago. Yeah. And uh, I, I was actually walking on the Feast of St. Benedict, July 11th. And uh, we concluded our day and we were staying in a monastery and there was, uh, sorry, a convent, and there was mass available that night and they had a pilgrim's blessing at the end of the mass. And I had been reflecting on St. Benedict, the person, but also St. Benedict, the parish and the role, the role of St. Benedict in my life and to where I'm at right now. And uh, uh, by the end of the mass, I was in tears, bawling my eyes out and... Uh, just realizing what came to me was it doesn't matter, God willing, I get ordained, but it doesn't matter what parish I go to, I'm always going to be a son of St. Benedict Parish, you know, mm-hmm. and that the the things that I have learned and experienced there are always going to permeate who I am and my ministry. Mm, beautiful. It's so exciting to, to, to think about all the divine renovation parishes, parishes that are implementing the divine renovation model all over the place, around the world. And, and you know, if, if we could find more Patricks, just how we, we how the, the impact it could have on the kingdom is just so exciting to me. So Patrick, I wanted to just thank you for, for being able to join us here on, on this podcast today and, and just blessings on you as you continue your, your journey in, in seminary. I, I, I'm so excited for what, what God's doing in you and, and what he'll He'll be doing through you when, uh, when God willing, you're ordained. Uh, if, if you're interested in learning more about Divine Renovation, I encourage you to visit us in the UK in 2019 because we're going there. Uh, hit up our website. We're doing a conference. Uh, ticket sales are available, so uh, you'll yep. be able to... That's coming soon, isn't it? Uh, yeah, soon it is. Yeah. yeah, it's coming up fast. In yeah. Birmingham. Don't Birmingham. stress me out about it now. Yeah. <laughs> now we've got an amazing group on the ground there. The agenda looks amazing. It's going to be a fabulous event. And we have a, besides, we now we have a new staff member who does events planning, which... We didn't have before. We didn't do any planning before. <laughs> now we're actually doing planning. It's great. It's wonderful. <laughs> so hit up our website if you want to find out more about that. Otherwise, just join us next week right here and, on this podcast. And we have a new uh, job. Uh, we're, we're hiring. <laughs> we Remember, are we're hiring. hiring? Yeah. Yes, we are. Yeah. We so check out, our, check out our website. Is that on the website? It the is job? on the website. Yeah. Yep. It's on the website and on our social media. So our Facebook. If you haven't aren't following us there, follow us there. Twitter. All right. I'm going to close this podcast now. Don't interrupt okay. again. Otherwise, <laughs> I'm never going to get off. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much and God bless. Yeah.